I, I know that the main reason that people uh, have kept coming to these case conferences all these years is because they're about behavior. And behavior is really a common problem in pediatrics. Between 25 and 50% of presenting problems in pediatric practice are behavioral. And if you survey uh, mothers of two, three, and four-year-olds, 90% have some concern about behavior. And 20% of mothers of four-year-olds have significant concern. And that sounds like um, a big problem, and in fact it is, because that's about the same uh, percentage as goes on to have mental health disorders throughout childhood and adulthood, too. But feeding problems are something that uh, can often be addressed fairly quickly, and even though the kid doesn't actually want to branch out from pudding or chicken nuggets necessarily, they do have a better life when they've been able to expand their choices. And the management um, is usually fairly rapid. So in the case of autism and feeding disorders, it can be much slower. Um, but management of these kinds of things may prevent serious uh, physical nutritional problems as well as other kinds of things like social isolation. And often the problem with feeding starts with a problem in the balancing act that all parents have to do between accepting the baby's dependence and then allowing the baby's independence. And then it works the other way around for kids, that they're very dependent in the beginning, and then they want to become more independent, but on their own terms. So when we're talking about eating and feeding problems, if you think back to the very youngest babies we see, if we are seeing them in the hospital before discharge, we tell them to breastfeed every hour and a half uh, as needed, right? But sometimes we forget to tell the parents when they should start stretching that out. And that kind of constant feeding is actually a reasonably good form of birth control and it's practiced around the world um, and keeps babies alive in lots of countries, but it does get in the way of developing nighttime sleep in many uh, situations in young children. Um, so if the parent, though, is complaining that the baby is uh, a pain because they're eating too often, one of the things that you should think of it's not so much a feeding problem as the possibility of maternal depression. Um, but it is exhausting for anyone. So keep in mind that feeding is one of the best ways to regulate a baby's state. And what I mean by that is their alertness or their sleepiness and also whether they're crying or not. So babies tend to cry when they're hungry and sleep when they're full. But when you see an, an excessively crying young infant Always think about inadequate feeding first, um, because we should always we should never ignore that, um, because that is the main reason young babies cry. And of course, if they're getting diluted formula or they're breastfeeding, but there's actually not enough supply of breast milk, those can be re reasons for excessive crying. So, but don't let me put you off to think that breast isn't best, because of course breast is best, and it's best for mothers and their long-term health. Um, as well as for babies. But here's some other things about breastfeeding that you may not have thought about. And that is, when the mother is breastfeeding, the baby is being exposed to flavors of the foods the mother eats. That actually happens in utero also to some extent. And we're becoming more aware of that when it comes to things like um, exposure to peanuts. Seems like now it actually helps reduce the likelihood of allergies to peanuts later. That may be true for other foods as well. Peanuts has been sort of the big bad boy of allergies because it's common and can be quite severe. The next thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to feeding is that breast milk alone may not be enough for growth by about seven months of age. And there's something else that goes on as babies move, uh, move on through the first year of life, and that is if they don't get solid food in the window, there's a window, sort of a sensitive, not critical period, but at least a sensitive period for tolerating solids, it gets to be much, much harder. So introducing solids, and by solids I mean, you know, baby food, I'm not talking about steak here, is actually essential between six and 10 months of age. And I remember in my own training, I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician, in case any of the rest of you didn't know that. Um, but I had a wonderful um, mentor at one point uh, who was a speech-language pathologist. 
And he taught me a very important thing about feeding. And speech language pathologists are often experts on feeding problems, actually. Um, and that is that feeding is not inherently pleasurable to young babies. That they're basically having to choose between being hungry and being able to breathe. So it's a big coordination job for them to figure out how to get the food through the back of their mouth and down into their stomach without uh, not being able to breathe. So it's, it's kind of a struggle. And actually, you'll often hear parents talk about when they introduce solids or, or baby food that the baby would choke and sputter and spit it out, and the parent really felt mean trying to push forward on feeding. And so sometimes they give up. Sometimes they give up. And when they give up and they miss this window, then you have things like that 10-year-old who is only eating pudding because the child has never learned how to tolerate um, food of greater consistency than that, even though it's not good nutrition. So those are some things to know about. Now, it turns out that the preference for sweet, I'm sorry to tell you this, but the preference for sweet starts in utero. <laughs> and how do we know that? Well, they ingested high concentration uh, glucose into a pregnant woman's uterus, and what they saw was the baby would start gulping and swallowing really fast because they were enjoying the flavor. And if they stuck in quinine instead, quinine is very bitter, the babies would go, eh, and stick out their tongue. So even in utero, babies have taste preferences. But what happens throughout um, infancy is that babies start to learn to expect food at certain times, not constantly, not every hour, but at certain times and certain caloric densities of food as well. Um, and they learn which foods to satisfy their uh, hunger the fastest. And this is a lesson that carries on throughout life, and that is when you're really hungry, you reach for that candy bar. In other words, things that are sweet have fat or high carbohydrate because those things end up raising your blood sugar the fastest. So there's instant reinforcement, almost instant reinforcement from eating those things. To say nothing of the fact that they taste good, of course. And maybe the reason we are programmed to think they taste good is because they are so valuable at, in terms of uh, getting some calories into our system. So the next thing that babies learn is how much to eat. So intrinsically, infants, if given a chance, will stop when they're full. And this is one of the reasons that breastfeeding is so good because the mother doesn't know how much they got, the baby seems satisfied and stops sucking, and there you are. It's all good. Whereas when you arbitrarily pull out a bottle, and heaven help us, if it's not a four-ounce bottle, it's an eight-ounce bottle, and the parent sort of fills it up to a certain line and then thinks that the baby will take it, the babies may struggle and spit up and have trouble with that, um, at first, they will try to stop, but what happens is they get used to having a larger volume of food. So when to in toddlerhood, um, babies, toddlers will, if it's something they like, basically eat whatever you give them. And then by preschool, the amount and the kinds of things that children eat is more determined by watching other children. So there's sort of a sequence in how internally motivated the volumes of food are, which is kind of interesting. So one of the things that comes up immediately in our culture is that baby foods are commercially determined how much they are and how chunky they are, like how smooth versus chunky they are. So the amount of baby food in a jar is a total invention. And it's often true that parents feel like they should feed them down to the last drop in that jar of baby food, but in fact, that, that is not a gold standard of any kind at all. In fact, there's not even any magic to giving kids vegetables before you feed them fruits. Um, for babies who are just learning how to eat, fruits may actually be better because they are interesting, more if they're sweeter, and they're more willing to suffer through figuring out how not to choke while they're taking it in order to get that nice hip taste. So what can you do to make sure that children get introduced to a variety of textures in that first life. Well, the baby food companies try to do that for you by going stage one, stage two, like that. But there's other ways that parents can do it if the lumpiness in stage in the next stage of food is not well tolerated. They can do things like 
smash up fruit or cracker crumbs and put it into the smoother baby food in order to get to a more, um, a more a larger amount of texture. Now, for the person who brought up the kids that 10 year old with autism, that may be a good place to start. Now, I'm going to go past that, but this child is not tolerating a range of textures, right? And so trying to get more texture into their diet may be the first thing that you need to do to be able to allow them to move from pudding to anything else. That's a very big problem. Whereas a six-year-old who's at least eating nuggets and fries, they've at least got a, t a texture and something that has to be chewed. So they're ahead of that child, the other child that we just heard about. So it's really important to start increasing the lumpiness of food before 10 months of age to avoid these problems. Now, some other good tips for, uh, for feeding young children include um, eating solids before feeding liquids at a meal. Okay, and the reason you want to feed solids before liquids at a meal is because uh, the liquids will fill them up and the solids are harder. So when they're hungry, they can, giving them the solids when they're hungry uh, is uh, a way to make it's more likely that they'll actually take the solids, um, whereas if you let them have their bottle first, they're pretty much satisfied. They're not willing to go through the work that it takes to eat solids. And uh, another good rule of thumb that fits into this context of uh, increasing lumpiness from six to ten months and thereafter is that you should be aiming for a baby to be using a cup and eating table food by 12 months of age. Now, people sometimes say, well, they don't have any teeth. Well, or they do have some teeth, but all they have is those decoration teeth up in the front. So anything that you can squash with your thumb, a baby can smash with their gum. And actually, if you ever stick your finger into the mouth of a 12-month-old, you know full well that their gums are really strong and they can really smash stuff up. So that's a great way of, of telling parents, you know, what kind of texture should you be able to feed to a 12-month-old by then? And... The opposite is also true, and that is don't make it too easy by letting them carry a bottle around all day. And I think that the word has gotten out that we shouldn't be giving juice. In fact, probably it's better not to have any juice at all, but just to feed fruit instead of juice, um, because juice tastes so good that people will drink juice, and it's easy, and they will prefer it to other things, and they will have all the complications of that extra sugar, including bigger swings in their blood sugar and um, rotting their teeth and getting obese and all that sort of thing. But milk bottles can have a, be a problem too because it's just too easy, especially if they're allowed to walk around with them. So any comments about infant eating before we go on to toddler eating? Anybody have an infant example where they've got, people have gotten stuck or relate to any of the things that I just said about babies in the first year of life? I just wanted that. This is Dr. Sterner. Yeah, <clears throat> I had the experience of seeing uh, some babies who had uh, who essentially uh, uh, never had uh, solid food. They were bubble babies with uh, immune deficiency. And then two years old, and they were on the ward, and they said, uh, gee, th these kids can't take any texture. There was, otherwise, these kids are perfectly normal. And what I came to understand uh, is that at as you started to allude to, at, at about a year, is a relatively critical time to learn how to bite and chew, and even earlier, as you said, dealing with texture. And if it doesn't happen, it is all hell to pay when you get to be two years old and you're just having mush. Um, uh, so so um, that's, you know, and, and as you said, that, that child who's still having mush later, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem. So, But I'm going to tell you how you, you can approach it, although in those more severe cases, you may very well need some help. But you know what? This help is not so, hard, not so easy to get. So I'm going to give you some suggestions for things that you can actually do. So, so let's talk about toddlers next. So one of the things that happens when babies hit toddlerhood, which is after 12 months of age, sort of technically, and that is their growth actually slows down. So do you ever think about that growth curve and you show it to parents and the child is accelerating and accelerating, and then around a year of age, they actually start to slow down in their growth, and they actually require 
fewer calories to grow than they did before. But this is very scary to parents. Um, what they see is their toddler, who some days, even when they're feeling fine, basically eat nothing. Zero, they eat nothing, they refuse everything. But the next day they may have, you know, two hard-boiled eggs and three bananas. So food jags are really important to recognize because they panic parents who then get into some sort of coercive patterns of trying to get the kid to eat and making it into a power struggle where it really doesn't need to be a power struggle. Because if you tell them your child will eat what they need over 48 hours, it yeah. helps them relax and not worry about that day when the child seems healthy. Obviously, if they're not healthy, that's another matter. But if they seem healthy but they're not taking anything in, they shouldn't panic. And if they only want one kind of food, don't worry, they'll want another kind of food soon. In fact, there was a study done back in the 1930s that's been actually was replicated about 10 years ago that showed that if you put out a range of healthy foods in one of those, you know, a dozen cupcakes, right, one of those tins that has a dozen holes for cupcakes to be baked in, and you put different food in the different holes and let the child age 12 months choose exactly what they want to eat every day, as long as you don't include sweet or sweet fat food, they will actually eat a nutritionally balanced diet over the period of a month. Isn't that interesting? So they know what they need unless you distract them with sweet foods. So that's another good reason for avoiding the candy and potato chips because that will be preferred over the healthy food. So um, what is another reason that parents have trouble with this toddler picky eating that's normal, these food jags, and that is they've just accepted the incredible dependency of their baby and they're used to feeding this baby and keeping it alive day after day and suddenly they kind of miss it. They kind of miss the fact that the baby now wants to do things for themselves, including eating. So the biggest issue that comes up really is the battle of the spoon, and that often comes up around eight months of age, not as a toddler, but as an eight-month-old, because that eight-month-old has gone through a period that's called hatching, and that is they want to start doing things for themselves, and if the parent continues to make to keep control of the spoon when they're feeding the baby, there are some babies who will actually stop eating from the spoon, turn their faces away, because what they want to do is feed themselves. And this is so common that it's actually one of the most common reasons for failure to thrive between 9 and 12 months of age. It should be the first thing you think about if a kid starts falling off the growth curve is the battle of the spoon because it's all about independence. Now, the problem is since behavior has meaning for the child and the family and it can be initiated or maintained by that meaning, you've got parents who go into a panic about the child either feeling like they're being rejected by their child um, or feeling as though there's something wrong with their child, and they go into a panic and may come to see you if you're lucky early in the game. Because after all, food is love, right? And so if you all were right here instead of in your various places around the country, um, I would be serving you some kind of snack to go with this lecture. <laughs> hope you've got some for yourself, because that's not what I'm doing. But we all know that food represents love, and that actually is one of the things that complicates feeding um, at every age, actually, because when the child rejects the parent's food, the parent feels rejected, and the parents may feel as though giving food is the best way they can demonstrate their love to the child, um, even if they're ambivalent in other ways. So now we're into toddlers, and we need to talk about the child's need for mastery. So children need an opportunity to master things uh, with respect for their autonomy, but avoiding either overwhelming them or neglecting them. So we talked about the battle of the spoon, but this can come up even at older ages with parents who are either overprotective or overly strict or really inconsistent or don't set adequate limits and routines. Now in the case of food, serving food at the table at regular times, there should be three meals and at least two snacks for young children. But my advice is always at the table. Rather than walking around with snacks or walking around with a bottle or taking it in the car except for emergencies, keeping it as a routine to be done at the table and to be a social event is a great way to help children 
regulate themselves, um, avoid being overly hungry, give an opportunity to talk to your kid. That's another good thing about mealtime routine. And actually, it reduces both the extreme food selectivity problem, and um, it also helps um, uh, helps avo avoid uh, children who feel angry at their parents. So number one suggestion for toddler eating, and this actually extends right up into school age and actually right up into teenage, we'll say some more about that a little bit later, and that is having an expectation <coughs> for feeding at regular, pre-regular times, but giving toddlers plenty of finger foods to eat so that they can do it themselves. And basically there's hardly anything a toddler can't eat with their hands except maybe soup. They can certainly eat ice cream with their hands. They can eat jello with their hands. They can eat um, uh, foods like green beans that have been cooked in the microwave to make them sort of soft. They can eat all of those things um, with their hands. And then they're more likely to have a um, no struggle at the table. And we learned from our son, Dr. Sterner and I happen to be married, if you didn't know that. Um, our son, Sam, was a great eater. And at around, I'd say, 15 months old, he started to protest being in his high chair. And we didn't realize right away what that was about because we were letting him feed himself, and he was a good eater overall. And what we found out was he wanted to be at the table with everybody else not in his high chair by the table. For him, that was a big distinction. And when we took the tray off and pushed him up to the table, he's been fine ever since. And he's now six foot five. <laughs> so he got plenty of nutrition over time. So that's another thing just to keep in mind. Now, another thing that gets parents in trouble sometimes is when they try to serve foods that are too complicated, meaning things like casseroles and stews, children especially in the at the end of the second year of life, start to get more picky about the components of food. And sometimes they get particular that the foods shouldn't even touch. Um, besides that, if the parent puts too much energy into making fancy food, then the parent may feel like they want to push the kid to finish it all rather than so-called wasting food. So when there's a struggle like that going on, I recommend to parents that they uh, – put the baby in the high chair naked and put them over plastic um, and then put them in the bath afterwards. And when I say naked, I'm, you know, the baby's naked, but it's okay if the parent's naked too, whatever they want to do. But the idea is to make a joke about it so that they'll realize that messy eating is actually to be expected. They should just make it as easy for themselves as possible. Children will eventually learn to use a spoon. It should always be offered, but if the child prefers to eat with their hands, it's better not to struggle over that. Okay, now what about the toddler, or this would apply to preschool children as well, who refuse food or beg and gorge and overeat on food? Let's skip ahead to my next slide. Let's see, where's the slide? Uh, there we go. Problems with supplementation. Pediasure. It's great nutrition, but it gets in the way of everything else. Mm -hmm. So it, supplements can, be, can, be, can make you feel more comfortable because they have a lot of calories and protein, um, but there's a lot of pro and vitamins, but there's problems too. And that is they really remove the drive to eat. And they can also cause constipation because they don't have enough fiber in them. The other problem with these things is it doesn't in introduce any variety of tastes or textures. So it's worse than milk in that way because it's more complete food. So I think the Pediasure is your nemesis. And okay. now you have a model for Pediasure also. So the first thing you have to do is be very brave. And that is you have to be able to remove the Pediasure from the diet. And that is you've got to be brave about this. Don't worry, you won't starve your kid. And uh, for certain families, the, the, the need to feed their child is really overwhelming, particularly, I don't know if this applies to your family, but if you've come from a culture that has ever, in the last few generations, been short on food, has anybody in your family ever in the last few generations been short on food? Um, sometimes that's the case, like people who've been through the Holocaust or something like that. But um, it's very important realize that you're digging yourself a hole by giving Pediasure 
that's going to be very difficult to get out of. So you have to be brave and stop the PD sure, and then do the following. So now I'm going to talk about the slide I'm on again, which is a, a great uh, method for helping with both kids who overeat and kids who refuse to eat. And I call it the food routine. So basically, here's how it goes. You put out finger foods and some little drinks, uh, not a lot of drinks, but little drinks, on a low table where the child can get at it, but the dog can't and leave them up there all day long. Now, you can rotate the ones that are likely to spoil, and if you're really compulsive, you can uh, keep a record, but you cannot talk to the child about what they're taking in. The child should also be invited to the table at mealtimes and asked to sit there for a few minutes, but let down when they want to get down. And here's what happens. If you don't talk to the child about food at all, typically in about a week, that child will prefer to eat at the table with the family over having the food from that little table of their own. Now, it doesn't mean they're allowed to take the food all over the house. The table, the food can be restricted to one room, like the kitchen or the dining room, whatever you want to do. But the hardest part here is dealing with the emotions of the adults. Now, sometimes it'll be the mother, but more often I would say it'll be, who do you think? Grandma, right? Grandma is often the culprit in these things. So this strategy would be useful for both your four-year-old and your nine-year-old. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're panicking because your child is thin, hey, you should be feeling lucky because being thin is good for you. And take a look at whatever your growth curve was when you were little and think about whether, in fact, maybe that's the normal growth curve for your family instead of thinking that they have to sit on some arbitrary growth curve put out by a formula company or even the CDC, because not everybody's going to be average, and the, and the pattern of growth is uh, very individual. Okay, you notice at the bottom there, refer for therapy of psychodynamics. So if you can't manage this on your own, okay. there may be some issues that have to be addressed as well. So I don't know you at all, but I would just say take this seriously. See if you can work on it together as a family and be brave. If I tell you three weeks, do you think your wife can do it? Yes, yeah, she can. She can. Great. Three weeks, no PD assure. Just a little table out there with food and invite the kids to the meals. So let's talk about picky eating next because I think that's probably on the mind of a lot of people on this call. And there is a sort of typical picky eating uh, that – it's a combination of temperament. Some kids are sort of more, more likely to be hang back in any kind of change. It can come from a desire for autonomy, but it also comes from a, a cognitive awareness of differences. And this often presents around 21 months of age when children who have been eating everything under the sun before that suddenly start to refuse certain textures. They want certain ways of preparing the food. The sandwiches have got to be cut on a certain angle or the crusts have to be removed or they want some ritual. They have to have their certain spoon or their certain cup. And that's a, an almost a little phase of obsessive compulsive that fits in between 21 months and around three to four years old. It can be true uh, any time during that period. But let's just talk a little bit about how uh, food preferences develop to start with. And the first and most important factor in food preferences is actually culture. So there are cultures where people drink blood and eat ants, and everybody does, and that's just the way it is. Um, there are also families that don't eat certain things, families that don't eat fruit, families that don't eat broccoli. We even know some families and presidential families who don't eat broccoli. <laughs> there, there are also certain non-preferred types of food by most children, and these include um, spinach, so the reason people, kids don't like spinach, even though adults often do like spinach, is because it has oxalic acid in it. And did you know that when people are fetuses, that they have taste buds that go all the way down their larynx and all over their hard palate? And then as you get older, those taste buds recede so that when you get to be an old gomer, you want to put Tabasco sauce on everything. But keeping in mind that children have more sensitivity to strong taste um, when they're little than they will later on. Now, another factor that makes a big difference in what foods people will eat are food models. So that's why Popeye, 
Remember Popeye? What, what did Popeye eat? Spinach. Spinach, right. Now, they thought, they talked about Popeye is eating spinach because it made you strong. Actually, spinach doesn't make you strong, although it does have iron in it. But the reason they picked spinach was they were trying to convince kids to eat spinach. So if everybody wanted to be strong like Popeye, they would have a hero like Popeye showing that he likes to eat that. And that's where the milk mustache comes from. Now we put the milk mustache on what movie stars and stuff like that. Uh, trying to convince people to drink milk. Um, even you may, you, you may or may not know this, but a lot of people, as they, even as they get out of infancy, in many cultures can't digest milk anymore. They have lactose intolerance. So the milk industry is working really hard to make all the movie stars look like they love milk, even if it's not something that, tastes, that uh, fits very well with you. Um, now, another thing that influences what foods kids eat are food contingencies. Now, for a long time, um, I was talking about food contingencies of if you have to bribe a kid with, to eat a food, if you have to bribe them with something good in order to eat the food, they figure out that that must be, mean it's a bad food. But actually, it turns out that bribery works, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute, um, and actually increases food uh, variety if it's done in a certain way. But some of the things that really help children eat a variety of foods is the models of a pleasant meal time with social uh, attention and meal and interaction at meals, not fighting and not having the what on during meals. The television. So the television is interfering with good nutrition because it's not a social interaction. Um, and in fact, sometimes the things on television can be quite upsetting. So turning off the TV is really an important part of having effective uh, training for food variety and uh, healthy eating. But when you get right down to it, the, the most important thing, as it turns out, to increase food variety, which is the two kids that we've talked about so far, the nuggets and fries kid and the pudding kid, is they need repeated tasting. And this is actually the beginning of what I'm going to tell you about how to work on severe food selectivity, which both of those children have, one more than the other. So it turns out that repeatedly tasting even a tiny bit of a food will increase the variety eating, eaten. Now, repeated looks are good, but it's not enough by itself. And there's a book that I'll tell you about, and it's in the references if I get down to the bottom of the slides, by a guy named Keith Williams. And he has written a terrific book. He's from Penn State. And this is a book that will help with that autistic kid in their eating and will help with that kid on the nuggets and fries as well. And you can recommend the book to parents um, as well as reading it yourself. But I'm going to give you the short form of his book, okay, because I learned a lot of this stuff from him. So when they used modeling of, e of people eating the food that the child doesn't like and praise and sticker rewards, they were able to increase the variety of vegetables eaten with the rewards, and the child even reported liking the foods better. And that was when they used rewards and praise for eating a variety of foods. So there's some things that you can do to set kids up for success in increasing a variety of foods. So the first thing is, this is for typically developing kids. So we're not into the severe cases yet, it, but it's good for the severe cases too. And that is, first of all, three meals and probably three snacks, but only at the table. Then make sure that the undesired foods are also placed on the child's plate. So the child doesn't have to eat it, not in the beginning anyway, but they have to leave it on their plate. And if they push it off their plate, it gets served again or they're dismissed from the table. So it's a, we're training them to accept a new food on their plate. And then how do you introduce some of these new foods? Well, start with ones that are similar to what the child already eats. So for the kid who eats uh, French fries, maybe French fried potatoes, maybe you can now serve French fried sweet potatoes or French fried green beans, so something that is similar to what they've already eaten. And then you can add microscopic amounts of the new food you want to introduce. And when I say microscopic, I'm talking about a dusting of molecules of the undesired food. And you say, how could that possibly work? Well, maybe homeopathy is right. It turns out that even a very tiny taste of the food will start to desensitize the child and make it more acceptable for them to take that food. 
Sometimes you can just change the brand. So instead of just McDonald's nuggets, uh, you can change to uh, Burger King nuggets or something else to try to give the variety that they need. Um, and you can then start sprinkling the undesired foods on foods that are currently eating, eaten. It also helps to model other people in the family, or better yet, their best friend comes over for dinner, and that best friend happens to eat uh, green beans. Um, that is really good to find out what they eat before you bring them over, because they might model aversive behavior too. So modeling does count, especially by a child who's well loved and who, or who is slightly older than the child at hand. So what about really severe picky eating? So it turns out that about 18% of young kids and 7% of older kids are picky eaters. But food selectivity is really on the order of a disorder. These are people who may omit entire food groups, no fruits, no vegetables whatsoever. And this can be bad enough that it restricts their growth and their nutrition, especially for things like iron and vitamin A and vitamin C. And of course, later on, because they don't just grow out of this, this doesn't just go away with age, it can be limiting to them socially because they can't go anywhere where food is being served. Some kids have such severe food selectivity that they cry or have a tantrum or gag or even throw up at the sight of an undesired food. Now, Keep in mind that somebody who has actually tasted a food and then vomited, that is one of the most severe uh, uh, aversive conditioning situations. And it actually makes sense, doesn't it? Because do you ever wonder how animals in the wild know what's poisonous and what isn't? How do they not eat poisonous plants? Well, what happens is they look at each other. And if somebody else eats a plant and then gags or spits it out, that's it for that plant. That the other people, the other animals watching, will never eat it again. So the same thing is true. And if you think about it for yourself, have you ever eaten a food, and then you got sick? Maybe it wasn't because of the food, but you just happened to be about to get the flu. Could you ever eat that food again? Often not. You just can't stand it because that's a very strong one-time conditioning. Now we also have to keep in mind the possibility that there are medical problems contributing to a food's a child's of food selectivity. Uh, so food poisoning is the example I just gave. Allergic reactions are more common than we used to think. That that redness that spreads over the child's face may actually be an anaphylactic reaction to the food, especially if the child then has a diarrhea stool afterwards. That can also be a sign of anaphylaxis. So not severe anaphylaxis, but a severe enough allergic reaction that the food should be avoided for that reason. There are also children who have gastroesophageal reflux who um, become food averse because of reflux and the kind of um, esophagitis that they get with that. But keep in mind that oral motor incoordination is actually um, a neurological condition. It may be the only kind of cerebral palsy that a child has, but it can be severe enough that the child basically is not safe to take solids. And that's where having a, a feeding evaluation, often including something like a, food, a barium food swallow, um, with video fluoroscopy by a speech language pathologist who's an expert on this or an occupational therapist, some of them are trained in it too, to try to sort that out. So if you're hearing about choking and gagging on food after a year of age, that child may very well deserve more of a workup. Um, children who seem to aspirate and cough may have a tracheoesophageal fistula, that's important to recognize too, or the aspiration can be from the oral motor and coordination. And I already mentioned lactose intolerance as a reason for not preferring foods that contain lactose, even if they don't realize that's what's happening, they, they realize that they, they've been conditioned to realize they feel sick after they've had foods that include milk. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, underneath all of this, and underneath is probably a good word, because the next thing I'm gonna mention is constipation. So being a food selective, a, a very selective eater can actually result in not getting enough fiber in the diet and that can lead to constipation, and then constipation leads to cramping at meals and anorexia. So some of you probably have kids with ADHD who are constipated, and we compound it by giving them medications that reduce their appetite. They come to the table, they take one look at the food, and they, and they leave the table. So part of that is because of the cramping of constipation. So always think about it and ask carefully, um, because people don't often understand that uh, infrequent or hard, large, painful stools or blood on the toilet paper, those can all be 
significant constipation, even when there's no soiling, those can be a significant uh, reason for anorexia as well. Now, there are also kids who have anxiety disorder, and that's why they don't eat, and that may also apply to that child with autism, that they're anxious about things that they don't recognize, and they can't overcome their anxiety easily. There also may be a sensory integration disorder and trouble with different kinds of sensory stimuli, not just food, but possibly including food. Again, that fits in with many kids with autism, although not everybody with sensory integration problems has autism. And finally, you see on my list autism, because we're all dealing with lots of kids with autism, one in 68 now, and quite a few of them, but not all of them, have trouble with extreme food selectivity. So unfortunately, these problems tend to persist. The food variety that's eaten um, is actually higher at 27 months than it is at 60 months. And the food selectivity, the fruit selectivity at age two predicts to how it is at six to eight years old. 40% of irregular eaters at age five are still having trouble at age 14. And 28% of two to four year olds, they have food fads, but 16% of older kids, seven to nine year olds, have periods of refusing foods. So these are not rare problems at all. So now I'm gonna tell you about the thing that Keith Williams is doing at Penn State. And by the way, Penn State isn't very far, either for those people in New York or for those people in Baltimore, for sure. Um, so if you wanna make a referral, they do have a feeding food selectivity clinic there. But this is basically what they do. And this is something that you can recommend to parents at home. They should have two plates. On one plate, they put pea-sized pieces of the new food that the child has not been accepting, or even grain of rice-sized pieces of that food. And then on the other plot plate, they put bite-sized pieces of foods the child likes, plus they have a little bit of drink available. And here's what they do at the table. For 10 minutes, they require a, a taste of A before they can have a bite of B plus a small drink. And if they eat nothing at all, it's okay. You don't criticize them or punish them for that, but they don't get anything else until the next meal keeping in mind that we're going to do this three meals and three snacks a day. An alternative would be they take one little bite, a grain of rice or a grain the size of a pea, of the undesired food per meal or even per day in order to gradually get used to the undesired foods. Now, in the case of something that's a liquid, like when you're trying to get a kid to go from breast milk to uh, whole milk, um, fading them in by mixing the milks together, uh, really works well, and we all sort of know that. But the same thing can apply to tastes, so that you can mix tastes in a liquid as well. So that is the basic recipe for getting over this extreme food selectivity. Now, you have to have parents with buy-in for this. They've got to be brave. They've got to be confident and just say, okay, if you don't want to eat any, that's okay, you're down. You're down from the table and uh, we'll see it again at the next meal. And they have to do it without getting angry, shouting, or forcing the child to eat in order for this to work. 